Okay, so I will continue with introducing myself. Like I said before, my name is Marianne. I work with AWID. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and for those who may not be seeing me, I am a black woman in my 20s uh, with long braids and a light pink shirt on. And in my background, there is a white wall unit and I think a gold chair. <laughs> um, and I am based in Kigali, Rwanda at the moment. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, uh, this is a visual description that we're sharing uh, to give folks who are uh, visually impaired just an idea of where we are, what we look like, and where we're located. So I invite uh, my co-moderator -moder and panelists to do this as well, if you're comfortable. Um, today's webinar is part of a six, is the first of a six-part series called Conversations About Labor Migration from a Feminist Lens. Um, and as you can see, we have up on I have up on the screen some community guidelines that we would like us all to just keep in mind while we go through uh, this conversation and the next ones to follow. Um, I won't re read through all of them just uh, for the sake of time, but I hope we can uh, have a look at those. Um, so as I mentioned before, my co-moderator today is Vandana, and she will, uh, in just a few minutes, I'll hand over the mic to her for her to let us know a bit more about the background behind the series and to give us an intro to our panelists for today. Um, and so we also want to share, I also want to invite people to engage and be present with us as much as possible today. We understand that we've been probably working in this virtual world for at least the past year, if not more. Um, and it comes with challenges. And sometimes we are also checking our phones, we are also checking our emails. And we, of course, understand that we ha all have uh, different obligations, but we invite you as much as possible to be present with us, to engage in the chat, to share any reactions that you have, comments that you have in the chat. And if you have any questions for the panelists, you're welcome to share those using the Q&A function. You can share those anytime that you like. We will address them later on, but there's it's very much okay to start sharing them uh, as soon as they begin. And if you have any questions directed to a specific panelist, you can mention their name or mention that. Um, and another thing I will also mention, because we are in the virtual world, we are almost entirely dependent on technology, on you know, technology to guide us through. And sometimes we have tech issues, we have freezes in our mic. And so I just want to remind folks that um, if that does happen, don't panic, take a moment, take a breath. Let us know in the chat. We have uh, Bobby from GATW who will be our tech support today. So if you need any support, you can uh, message Bobby, but we will also be around to uh, have a look. Um, and yes, yeah, so before I formally pass this over to Bandana to give us more instructions or to give us more background to this conversation, um, I also just want to say how excited and grateful I am that we are a part of this, that AWID is a part of this conversation. Um, it's, it's great to be able to co-host this series um, and to have this critical dialogue with you. And uh, I hope you'll be joining us today and for the following sessions. And so I will hand it over to uh, Bandana now. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I think uh, some people had difficulties with the uh, audio uh, and things. I hope people can hear me um, well. Okay. So good evening and uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, whatever the time zone and so on that you are in. Um, my name is Vandana and I'm speaking to you from Bangkok, from the International Secretariat of the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women, GetW. Um, welcome once again to the first session of Feminist Fridays. As Marianne said, it's a six part webinar series co-organized by AWID, uh, FLEX, GetW, Solidarity Center, and Women in Migration Network. Uh, before I go on to introduce the series and our rationale for doing this now, let me take a moment to acknowledge the difficult situation that we are all in, regardless of where we are and what our gender, class, caste, race, and other affiliations might be. True, the degrees of insecurities and risks we face are different, 
And the fact that we are able to connect with each other digitally does place us in a privileged category. But we can't deny that we are all now in the grips of fear and uncertainty. The last couple of months have been particularly difficult. And as our audience tonight is predominantly women, I am very aware that you may be multitasking. You may be in multitasking mode at this very moment. A sick child or a partner or relative to be cared for, a meal to be cooked, work emails and reports to be done, and your own tired body and mind that needs rest. The list, the list is long. On behalf of the entire organizing team and from me, I'm sending you healing energy, positive thoughts, hope and courage. This will pass. Uh, starting today, every third Friday at 1 p.m. GMT, that's the same time as now, for six Fridays, we have planned to host a conversation on a specific aspect of labor migration from an international in, intersectional feminist lens. All of you have read the background note and signed up. So you have an idea of our plans. Let me just quickly go over some of the points again. What's our rationale and why this series now? Many of you who are with us in this session have been researching labor migration, working closely with migrant workers and advocating for migrant workers' rights. And some of you are migrant workers yourselves. So I do not need to quote statistics to show to you that the last two decades have witnessed a steady increase in the scale of labor migration within and across national borders. Nor do I need to tell you about the precarity of low wage workers, many of whom are internal or cross-border migrant workers, the essential but neglected workforce worldwide. If the lived experiences of millions of migrant workers had always been difficult, if their successes and achievements were almost always a result of their personal courage, agency, and resourcefulness, and not because of the systemic support structures, the last six, 16 months have dragged that courage to almost a breaking point. Job loss, and with that loss of the only source of income for many, uh, wage theft, deportation, rejection within families, and for women, a huge amount of stress and care work. All these have been rampant. Each one of you, us, each one of you, have been doing our best at individual and organizational levels for many years now. But our collective best still falls short of the need, which is to address the precarity, to make migration a real choice, to get justice at every level for the migrant workers. All of you here know that our efforts, despite small successes here and there, fall short because we are working within a system that is designed to privilege profit over people, to make few people rich, very rich, at the expense of the labor of many others, at the cost of our planet, actually. We have an economy that favors the 1% of this world. There are many feminists with us tonight who are part of the struggles for equitable access to land, forest, water, the commons, and have fought long and hard for freedom from multiple kinds of violence, for rights to health care and education for all, for example. You, my sisters, you, our friends, you know only too well about the development-induced displacement and dispossession resulting in temporary circular labor migration into precarious work. This is where the need to have a holistic, intersectional feminist politics around labor migration comes in. To reiterate the questions in the background note then, how can we stand in solidarity with migrant workers, work with state and non-state actors for realization of their rights, but also critique the economic and development paradigms that increase precarious migration? How can we celebrate the agency and strength of migrant workers while also highlighting the abuse and exploitation they face? Or in the words of the Indonesian women migrant workers in our alliance, the question that they had asked us a decade ago, how can we have the right to live in dignity in our own country and also the right to leave if we want to 
and get just wages and respect in other countries. Right now, they have neither. These are some of the questions we grapple with within our organizations. And we know that many other colleagues also have the same questions. That belief created a need for conversations with a larger group of colleagues. Following some discussions within the organizing team, we sent out invitations for this series. The overwhelming response tells us that, that our invitation has resonated with many colleagues. Mediated by technology, these conversations are going to have limitations. But let's give it a try. Let this be a beginning of many conversations to understand the complex realities around us, to forge collaborative agendas for change, and to work together to realize those. As feminists, we believe that it is possible to resist development injustice and support the movements for rights and justice for migrant workers simultaneously. We also think that it is crucial to have intermovement, intersectoral, and intersectional dialogues and discussions on labor migration to understand the complexities of different sectors, systems, and structures. We in the organizing team see our intersectional feminist politics as a collective journey and a struggle. And we know that many of you will agree with us on that. We know that an understanding of and a belief in intersectional feminism does not automatically and instantly change our personal and political behavior. To live and practice intersectional feminism can be a lifelong project with many ups and downs. So with our feet firmly on the depressing reality, we are dreaming of transformative feminist futures and inviting you to be part of that realistic but visionary discussions. Without much further ado, let's start the first session. And towards the end, I'll come back and show you the series uh, de descriptions once again. So the first session focuses on what what exactly is a feminist lens on labor migration? We have a brilliant group of panelists with us this evening, and I will introduce them to you as we go. The structure of the session is simple. I just have two questions, and I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to respond to the same questions. During the first round, each panelist will get about eight to 10 minutes to respond. And after the first round of questions, we will have a five minute break during which Marianne, my co-facilitator has something interesting for you. We will then have the second question. And after that, there will be some time for question and answers. And as Marianne already said, you know, please type in your questions in the Q&A box and comments in the chat box. So the opening question is, can you tell us with an example, what, based on your work, what for you is an intersectional feminist lens on migration? Uh, the first person that we're going to go with this question is Dr. Tanya Bastia. Tanya teaches international development and migration at the University of Manchester. She's interested in social relations, inequality, mobility, and space. She's currently writing a monograph on transnational care. She has been carrying out research on Bolivian migration for two decades and has published a monograph on gender migration and social transformation, intersectionality in Bolivian itinerant migrations in 2019. And she has edited Migration and Inequality in 2011 and co-edited with Ron Skeldon, the Routledge Handbook on Migration and Development, that's last year. So over to you, Tanya, and uh, your time starts now. I've put my timer on. Thank you. Can you can you all hear me? Is that all good? Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Manzana, for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here. Um, thank you also, Marianne, for the really um, I really felt the, the introduction that you, you gave earlier at the beginning when we started. I really appreciate that. So I've never really described myself. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm speaking from Macclesfield, which is just south of Manchester in the UK. 
Um, I grew up in Italy. I'm Slovenian and Italian. I've got brown hair, graying a little bit, uh, olive skin, brown eyes, and my room is white. I've got some skeins of yarn around the room. You might not be able to see that. And I've got a drum um, stuck on the wall behind me, which looks a bit like a moon. Um, so what I'd like, uh, I've prepared today is just a few notes about intersectionality and uh, labour migration, answering Bandana's uh, question about what it is an intersectional lens on, on labour migration. No traducción? I can't, uh, um, is, should I wait a little bit before, is the translation going okay? Is that all working? Should I stop for a bit? Yeah, okay, so it's all working. Um, great, so um, you, yeah, so in intersectionality, what is it and what does that mean for a labor migration, um, for our understanding of labor migration? So my understanding of intersectionality is really a recognition that gender relations and gender inequality is always also class and racialized and ethnicized, as Bandana mentioned in, in the introduction. So we can't really talk about gender-based inequalities in, in any context without also recognizing that these inequalities are embedded in societies and economies that are also deeply racialized and organized according to class, ethnicity, um, and sometimes caste and other um, vectors of, of disadvantage. So the term itself, intersectionality, is usually um, referred back to Kimberle Crenshaw, who coined it in 1989 uh, in a paper that sh she was writing. She was a, she's a, a feminist law scholar. And in a minute, I'll, um, I'll, I'll paste, when I stop talking, I'll, I'll paste that really good TED talk that she's got about intersectionality. But it, within, within feminist uh, organizing, organizations, as well as feminist theory, there's been talk about intersectionality much earlier on. So if you look at some of Audre Lorde's work uh, from the 1980s, if not earlier, um, she talks about how uh, sex is also was also classed and um, and and intersected by class as well as race, and, and it, it was just the term intersectionality that that's kind of credited to Crenshaw. But it, we have a really long history. Um, we have a really long history of. Uh, we, as I say, feminists, have a really long history of dealing with intersectionality and intersectional inequalities. Um, Domitila Barrios de Chungara in the 1960s, 1970s, so she was uh, a Bolivian, she identified herself as a Bolivian, Bolivian miner's wife. Much of her writing uh, and, and her political actions, I would say, were very much intersectional. So she made um, a, a statement in the 1975 uh, UN uh, um, meeting, um, which was part of the International uh, Women's Year in that year, um, really critiquing mainstream feminism for not taking into account the realities of working class uh, women in, in Latin America. I hope the interpretation is, is going okay. Let me know. If, if you, I need to stop. Okay. Um, so in, intersectionality is really about how, how gender intersects with other, other forms of uh, is a disadvantage. But to me also intersectionality also means that we listen carefully, deeply and with respect with what is going on in a specific context. Um, we might have, I think as, a, as researchers, we might have preconceived ideas about what is going on and what the reality is in a particular context. But unless we're able to, to listen with respect, I think that that intersectional reality is not really going to come through. And I think if I can go back to Crenshaw's experience, she was a student of, of law, a feminist student of law, interested in gender-based discrimination. 
But when she started looking at specific cases of discrimination, she realized that the framing that she had that came from mainstream feminist theory couldn't really explain what was uh, going on. So she was faced with an example of a black woman who uh, wasn't given a job as a secretary in, in, a, in a factory where um, all the secretaries were white and all the operators were um, black uh, men, all the secretaries were white women. And, um, and, and when this case um, came to the labor tribunal, the judge ruled that she couldn't really have both class as well as, um, sorry, both race as well as uh, gender-based uh, discrimination because that would put her in favor because she could argue she could benefit from two types of discrimination. So there was really no space for her within uh, legislation at the time to make the case of why she wasn't, she wasn't given that job which is what that then led Crenshaw to, to coin the term um, intersectionality to explain how uh, gender as well as race intersect to, to, to discriminate against a specific person. So I think what Crenshaw did at the time was listen deeply to what was going on um, and effectively she had to change the framing that she had in order to make sense of the reality. Um, so when when I started, uh, so this is I'll, I'll give you an example about my my own research. Um, so when I started my doctoral my PhD research some twenty years ago, I was looking at how gender relations influence migration flows. It was uh, very much an ethnographic uh, based um, based study following migrants from Bolivia to Argentina. And, and that's kind of the framing that I had based on the literature that, read, that I had read on gender and, uh, and migration. But when I actually started doing the interviews, both in Bolivia, but particularly the ones in Argentina, what migrants, what Bolivian migrants stressed, both men and women, was the discrimination that they felt because they were Bolivians in, in Argentina. So they talked a lot about uh, xenophobia and racism that they experienced on a daily life. And the, 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 the gender element was, was very much, um, what was either naturalized or it, it was kind of uh, hidden within, within their life stories. And uh, when I came back from field work, in, in a way I started, I had to try to make sense. And, and in, initially I was quite worried that everything I got was about racism and discrimination and nothing on gender. But what that led me to, to do was to, to try to, to bring the two together. And although at the time I didn't really have um, the language of, of intersectionality, in the end I ended up talking about gender as well as race and ethnicity. And, and with time, I, I, I came to understand that, um, that, that that's what exactly what I was looking at. It was how gender, uh, gender inequality within that migration stream was also racialized and ethnicized. And that really influenced everything, influenced uh, the decisions to migrate, influenced how migrants accessed and used social networks uh, the types of jobs they got in Argentina, and then also what they did um, in Argentina in terms of how they, they organized themselves and the benefits that both men and women, as well as this particular group of people, managed to um, get or not get um, through, through migration, through their own experiences of migration. So I'll, um, I'll, I think I'm, I'm coming up to the 10 minutes. I might have one minute left. No, four seconds. I think that was well timed. Well done. And I'll pass back on to Bandana. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Tanya. That was perfect. So thank you very much. And now we, I'll come back to you the, after the first round. So now we go to uh, Mary and uh, Dr. Mary, uh, Setrana is a senior lecturer in the Center for Migration Studies, University of Ghana. Mary was the first woman to be appointed as a lecturer at the Center for Migration Studies. She's a Ghana-based researcher on a number of ongoing research projects, including 
the South-South Migration Project on Inequality and Development Hub, and Culture for Sustainable and Inclusive Peace Project, and uh, Migration for Inclusive African Gro Growth Project. Mary's research in interests include gender and migration, return migration and reintegration, and transnational migration and the diaspora. So over to you, Mary. Thank you, Bandana. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Please, can I have my pictures on to aid my, or oh, I can share my screen. Can I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Um, okay, I hope my time hasn't started. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me see if I can. I just have some pictures to help with the discussion. Okay, good. Um, can you please see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so good. Um, this is a picture I took from one of my field works when I was working with um, women in the informal sector. And so the first question, which I, I don't think I need to repeat, but thank you very much, Tanya, for setting the ball rolling. And so I will stand, <laughs> I will bet to stand on the, on the good grounds you have laid and then to continue laying the blocks. And so in my view, I was thinking the first question, how do I... Um, how do I see intersectionality? How do I um, describe it? And so I looked at the, the, the various symbols, African symbols, and I was, and in Africa, we do have a lot of symbols. In West Africa, we have the Dinka symbols. In Ghana, we also do use them. And so I was thinking about how, um, how we can project the complexities um, in the context of intersectionality. And I came across this very interesting symbol, which in our Akan language, we call it Nyan Santen Tain. Um, those of you don't know Nyan Santen Tain, it's, a, it's an Akan word, but it's literally translated as spider web. And so um, I decided to show you a picture of the spider web in case we have forgotten about it. It's, it's, we see how complex the spider web is. I'm trying to show my case, so I hope you can see. And so it has very various pathways, it's interlinked from different angles. And so when you are tempted to find yourself in, an, in a spider web, it's not easy to get out of it. Sometimes you may need people to help you to get out of it. And so that is how I see the intersectionality we are talking about. And so here is a symbol. If you look at the symbol, that's the black one. In this um, symbol, it is used to reflect the complexities of life of a person. So that's what it's, it means when you see any um, fabric with this symbol of spider web. And so here you see the different pathways that lead to this small hole. And so the pathways, can reflect the way um, female migrant workers experience their lives, the different pathways, the different attributes that impact and shape and mold their lives. And so I have this picture of these young girls, which I did interview them. So these couple of inter these girls are from the northern part of Ghana. We, we call them Kayayo. So Kaya means load. And so the carrying of the load is what they do. So when they move from the northern part of Ghana to the southern parts, they do carry load for shoppers and they charge them for the money. And why do they do this? How, what, what um, are the various attributes that uh, elements that impact their lives when they come to the south? And so here we can look at the social context in defining what our intersectionality is. The social context is important. So what's the history behind it? The history is that in the northern part of Ghana, these women, um, the northern part is one of the poorest regions in Ghana. And so these women, because of lack of jobs, moved to the southern part, which is um, presumably supposed to be um, relatively better in terms of income, in terms of job availability. And so they move from the northern part to the southern part to look for a job. And so here, if you see Aisha with the baby, I took permission, so they gave me the permission to show the picture. Aisha has a baby. And so here, she is a Kayayo, the head porter. So she has 
um, if you look at their ages, they are also young, between 1935. And so here, age intersects with the agenda. Why do I say that? Here, they, their age shows that they are, most of the studies have shown that they are in the childbearing age. And so when they move to the South, they, the likelihood of they having children is higher. And so childcare becomes intersects with the kind of work they do in addition to the fact that they are women, and so they need to take care of these children without any care provision or support for them. Again, when they also come to the South, there is some sort of social inequality because they are moving from a lower, um, a place with relatively poor environment to the South, which is presumably supposed to be, or described as better in terms of um, income, in terms of economic um, benefits. And so here, the, their background or where they are coming from also um, shapes the kind of attitude, the kind of identities that they have. Again, when they also, they, they do not have, most of them do not have higher education. And so education also intersects with the agenda. So they, when you meet them, when a shopper meets them and wants them to carry their load, negotiating on the amounts is one of the key things. Can they negotiate? That's something that they need to think about whether they can negotiate how much to take or not. But remember there are many, several of them. So here they are waiting for shoppers to call them to, carry their loads. And so once you shout, all of them troop in. Again, when it's like that, negotiating for your fee is also something that is minimal. And another thing is the historical context, which I just explained. Where they are coming from by culture, the Northern region is mostly um, patriarchal, may dominance. And so most of these ladies run away from the Northern region to the South without even informing their parents or sometimes their husbands, because the, the assumption is that the home is for the woman. And so migration is for men and not for women. And so once they move to the South, they are faced with so many um, they are faced with the different um, attributes that shape them because until you send money home, until you send remittances home, you are seen as coming to the South to engage in um, some, uh, some illegal act, acts which are not um, befitting of a lady. And so in the South, when they, the ethnicity is also one of those because they, they are from the Northern, the language is an issue because in the South, they don't speak the same language. Religion is also sometimes an issue, maybe not too much, but sometimes it is. And their ethnicity is also an issue because they belong to a certain, a different ethnic group. And so the different attributes, these different elements determine the kind of attitude experiences these women have when they move to the South to engage in head poetry or what we call the Kaya'i. And so coming back to the, the um, Nyan Santentan, which is the spider web, which means that there are different attributes, different elements such as age, such as ethnicity, such as um, um, child um, childbearing, such as the agenda, the migration status, if they have, even within, even within the South, sorry, they still have all those challenges. And so all these pathways impact, impact on the kind of experiences they have. And so using the whole as perhaps the representing the female migrant, you see that this whole is too small, but then it's being impacted from different angles. And the, the more impactful these things are, the more um, it pushes it and it's small, it makes the, the whole very small. And so that also shapes the kind of oppression, the multiple oppressions, the multiple discrimination these women go through when they migrate to the South in order to look for um, means of surviving. Why is this important and why are we studying this? Despite all these discriminatory practices, we should remember that these women contribute to development back home. They contribute to, they send remittances back home. No matter how small it is, they still send money back home. No matter how little it is, they still feed families back home. Sometimes they need to buy items, go back to marry. And in, before you can marry in the Northern part of Ghana, you, the woman should have had some basic utensils. And so for them to have access to these utensils, they need to move down South, work in order to acquire those items, go back to marry. Again, sometimes they are even running away from some cultural practices moving down south. And so these are things that they go through despite their development efforts towards their families, 
they themselves and also the community at large because they are in the care industry although we may not value it but when you go to the when you go to shop and you have so many things Working with these women, people pay lower than to go with a taxi, which will be carrying. And again, a taxi cannot follow you to the, the crowded area. So these women are able to follow you. So they are offering services, one to the larger country, to individual communities, and also to the various families. And so these are how I want to present it what I mean when I talk about um, the looking at intersectionality from a, a feminist um, lens. Okay, so before I, I stop, let me just describe myself. I think I that escaped me. So by now you have noticed my voice. And so um, I'm a black woman. I have um, stylish head, <laughs> very shaky. And then my background, I do have a poster and I have books um, as the background. And I'm looking colorful, I guess, is, is um, red with a mixture of different things. <laughs> And so that is um, who Mary is, and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mary. So we go with the same question now to Dr. Priya Deshinkar. And Priya um, is the Professor of Migration and Development uh, at the University of Sussex. And she led the tenure um, long migrating out of poverty consortium at the University of Sussex across which was carried out, the researches were carried out in several countries in Asia and Africa. So she's currently working on protracted displacement economies among refugees, as well as the sexual and reproductive health and mental health needs of internally displaced people and refugees in Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. Priya is actively involved in the policy dialogue on the new draft migrant, migrant labor policy in India. So over to you, Priya. Thank you very much, Bandana. Should I set on a, um, a timer so that I speak within the time limit? Yes, or that would be great. Me... No, you can set the timer. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so am I meant to describe my background and who I am, etc. Um, all right, so as you can see, um, I'm Indian, so South Asian. Um, I'm sitting in my house. And in fact, in the background, you can see some Indian items. I like to surround myself with these things to remind myself of home. Um, and um, that's me really. So it's very nice to be here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And of course we have had interactions with uh, GAD W before and admired the work that all of you do. And it's really wonderful to see how much interest this meeting has generated. So uh, let me just say a few words about uh, what I think about um, this question. So I'm going to draw on my past and recent research in India mainly, because that's where I really started to think about migration and labor markets. And, um, you know, I sort of came to this from the rural livelihoods angle. I wasn't really a proper migrationist in some in some ways or in in all ways, really. I was working on long term uh, projects in rural areas first for my PhD, which was very immersive. I spent a year in a remote rural village in Gujarat and later on um, on long term research projects in various parts of India. So what I did realize um, during those uh, projects was that what I was observing was extremely differentiated patterns of migration. And my interest has always been to understand how sort of oppressed groups uh, keep body and soul together, really. So my, my focus was on migration amongst poorer uh, sections of society. And I realized that it was extremely differentiated. And there was a huge gap between what I was seeing on the ground and whatever little I had read about migration or heard about it. You know, so what I whatever I had read and heard seemed to be different and also a bit more simplified than what I was observing. So for example, I found 
several completely distinct labor migration streams, even within the same village involving different castes and subcastes or jatis, uh, of course, men and women going for different kinds of work, like migration for sugarcane harvesting, for construction work, uh, paddy harvesting or harvesting other crops, migration for digging trenches for cable networks. So it's very, very differentiated. But of course, there's very little understanding of that in the literature and not that much um, data either, uh, which I've commented on a lot in my own writing. So I began to really examine the reasons for these observed differences. And what became clear to me was that unlike the sort of neoclassical representation of migration where it's more about the demand and supply and economic pushes and pulls or material deprivations, there were many other reasons um, or processes at work. And as I said, I was seeing that different castes were migrating for different work, which didn't correspond only to their education level, but more to their identity. So the kinds of work that they were being given depended on how their capacities and capabilities were being understood and perceived by people who employed them. And this actually reflected the pattern of employment in the villages as well. I mean, as all of you probably know, there is a qu quite a well-established caste hierarchy in, in many Indian villages. And although that is changing and in some way has become diluted, it still does persist. So there were differences in rural areas and some of these kind of spilt into, um, you know, work outside the village as well. And, and these differences were, are uh, quite stark and there wasn't much crossing over between them. And of course, gender intersected with all of this. So for women, migration meant negotiating, ne negotiating patriarchal norms within their families and also beyond in their spheres of work, both in the village and beyond, related to whether or not they should wor work outside the home, um, the different stages in their life course, you know, whether they were married or unmarried, their care responsibilities. So caste intersected with gender uh, for women, of course, and um, that is where the sort of intersectionality came into the picture. And this is how we needed to understand uh, the differences that were being observed. So the key is to understanding, I felt, how gender and social difference is creating unequal geographies of mobility. So, uh, you know, how are people migrating? Why are they migrating in different ways? And it wasn't just the kind of work that they were doing, but also the terms and under which they were recruited, how much they were being paid, um, you know, to what extent their rights were being protected. Um, so, a variety of differences, which I will go into in greater detail in the next part of this discussion. But one, what I want to flag here uh, at this point is that we need to bear in mind that both of these constructs, caste and gender, are quite fluid um, and changing because of migration. For example, women from relatively poor and lower caste families or tribal families are migrating for domestic work in, in Indian cities. And of course, this is extremely exploitative as many studies have shown. Domestic work is uh, beyond the reach of the law because it's in people's homes. I mean, India hasn't yet signed the International Convention on Domestic Work. And there is a bill which hasn't become law yet. So they do remain unprotected and the working hours are long. They're at the beck and call of their employers. And there's a variety of other reasons uh, because of which they are in a very vulnerable position. But yet this kind of work can give them a modicum of independence. It, it does give them an opportunity to break away from traditional expectations surrounding marriage, childbearing, uh, and other um, you know, duties and roles that they're expected to fulfill had they remained back in the village. 
but their agency is highly constrained because they're still within that overall structural context in which labor um, or, or labor migrants are being kept at the bottom of the pile. And of course, for women, uh, there is a patriarchal structural context as well. So I just want to see how I'm doing. I've, I'm nearly out of time. Um, so I'll stop there and then I'll explore further in the next part. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Priya. Thank you very much. I think very interesting uh, issues are coming in. And uh, it's really good to hear how each person has entered and has kind of engaged with the issues of migration from an intersectional lens. So now we move on to um, Nicola. And uh, I don't think Nicola needs an introduction to a lot of people in this group. Uh, so Dr. Nicola Piper is the Professor of International Migration and Founding Director of the Sydney Asia Pacific Migration, Migration Center at the University of Sydney. She's currently um, a British Academy Global Professor Fellow hosted by Queen Mary University of London's School of Law and uh, a great friend of many years of the entire migrant rights community. So over to you, uh, Nicola. Thank you so much, Pandana, and thank you to you and your team for organizing this seminar series and for inviting us today to participate, which is a great honor, as Tanya said. Well, to start also off by, you know, introducing uh, myself, well, quite obvious and white aging woman who has recently decided to owe up to her, you know, the fact of aging by stopping to dye her hair and just go silver. So this is a recent um, development. And despite my Anglo, well, Saxon, well, if you like, um, uh, not a uh, um, track record, you know, as Bandana said, in terms of the institutions I worked at, the um, study I did, uh, you know, PhD and, 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 and master in, in the UK, I'm still a German national. I can't shake off my horrible accent despite trying, so you have to put up with it, I'm afraid. Um, and the wardrobe behind me is a Japanese sliding door, and that sort of gives away or signifies the um, region I am most knowledgeable of and deeply in love with, which is Asia. So I started off my career as a Japanese studies, uh, in Japanese studies. Um, I used to speak Japanese, which is now unfortunately very rusty. Um, and this is really where I engaged with labor migration for the first time and then branched out to um, show interest in the countries of origin. And then gradually it became Southeast, South Asia and Asia as, you know, a whole uh, region. And um, yeah, I still, you know, um, try to go back as much as I can. Um, and I guess the question uh, put to us um, is I, I, as a political sociologist um, and as someone who has over the last few years or almost a decade now um, worked on global governance of labor migration, um, which really uh, in many ways means, you know, the, uh, it points to the um, global level of policy making to get states and governments to agree on a common framework and approach to labor migration around the world. So for me, from that point of view, from that particular context, an intersectional feminist lens on labor migration is really uh, brilliantly epitomized by the ILO Convention 189 on decent work for domestic workers, uh, which Priya has also alluded to. Um, and it really, it's, if you like, it's birthing process, how it um, came into being. And in my view, this convention illustrates really well um, intersectionality and feminism in relation to labor migration in two particular ways. The first way, uh, the first way is the, the intersectional and feminist dimensions are enshrined in this convention's normative endeavor. Um, it aims to provide legal and so social recognition to an up to then unregulated and informal sector unrecognized and an unrecognized form of labor and type of worker who until then was often not even recognized as a worker. And in doing so, um, this convention really intersects, you know, what Tanya has also spoken about, gender with class, ethnicity and race, but also together, in addition, with perceptions of worth and value. 
as per the classification of work in this sector as often as low skill and, and actually often even as unskilled, but as feminists, of course, we, we try to really avoid this kind of language, you know, because we know care work is not an unskilled type of work. Um, and, and low wage also, uh, of, uh, sorry, and low skill often also is really used as a proxy for low wage, you know, to justify the very low, low wages um, these workers unfortunately earn. So in other words, there are additional axes of discrimination along the formality, informality, low skill to medium up to high skill spectrum, which I think we need to include in our conception of intersectionality. And secondly, the intersectional and feminist dimensions are also evident in the political activism, which has got us this convention in the first place. And this is from the alliances which were forged and still exist between various non-governmental actors in order to advocate and prepare the pathway for this convention spurs. And the participation of members of this alliance in the two year negotiation process and since its adoption in the campaigns for its ratification and in those countries which are state party to it now in the implementation so I mean the fight is you know goes on. And this alliance of this um, broad range of um, civil society uh, organizations uh, also comprises trade unions global union federations um, and deeply committed female trade unionists alongside uh, other uh, feminist activists, local domestic worker organizations, migrant associations and activist researchers. And one of the um, immediate outcomes of adoption of this convention was the formation of the first global union by and for women, the International Domestic, Domestic Worker Federation, which as of April this year has 81 affiliates from 63 countries and they represent nearly 600,000 domestic household worker members. And the other aspect I really would like to highlight is the um, fantastic political leadership by women from the global south. So activists from Latin America, Africa and Asia are really at the forefront of this struggle, you know, to get domestic workers um, their, their due rights. And for me as an academic who researches global migration governance from an institutional perspective, a feminist lens translates really into conceptualizing global governance. Well, first of all, as a political project and therefore as a project which is contested. Um, hence, it's a project which involves also bottom up processes through the activism um, by, you know, um, civil society organizations and unionists. So in other words, a feminist perspective involves analyzing global governance from the, from the experience of those affected by governance. So here in this particular case, meaning migrant domestic workers. And this also really leads to the argument uh, for the need of an inclusive governance, you know, an inclusive governance systems or models which provide participatory channels uh, for those most affected. And here, I guess, in this regard, the International Labour Organization and the experience of its Congress in 2010 and 11, which led to this convention, um, provides an actually quite a positive example because something quite unusual happened. And this is the, um, the domestic workers um, were among national trade union delegations. Uh, they were included uh, in some uh, national trade union delegations um, to be uh, present and to speak from their own experience, i.e. they used personal testimonies to share their experience of migrant domestic workers in, you know, in plenary settings where governments and employers sat alongside other trade unionists and employer organizations. And one such um, domestic worker turned activist um, was, and still is, because she's still active, is um, a Filipina uh, domestic worker called Melissa Begonia, who first migrated to Singapore and then uh, migrated onwards to the UK with you know, her new employer. 
and then decided, you know, when she learned how many domestic workers in London and around the UK experienced similar problems as she did, um, to start an organization which um, became Justice for Domestic Workers, and um, then sought support by a British trade union, Unite the Union, they became an affiliate, and this is how she ended up being uh, a member of the um, British delegation to the International Labour Congress, but she was then one of these um, uh, uh, powerful um, uh, domestic uh, worker voices who, who gave a testimony. And the International Domestic Worker Federation, I mentioned just a moment ago, sprung out of this ILO process. So the first uh, trade union, as I said, set up by women for women uh, and those working in the up to then informal sector with clear leadership from the Global South. Um, and uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I shall stop here and continue with other insights in relation to the second question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for that. And um, Marianne, do we take a few minutes uh, break here? We are just at one hour. Yes. So, yeah. and can, if you can't hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Everyone hearing okay? All right, great. So, yes, we will take a five minute break, but before we uh, turn off our cameras and kind of step away, get a drink. I wanna lead us in a short feminist stretch, like guide stretching or guided stretching that uh, my colleague Nino shared with me. It's very brief, so bear with me. It'll probably take less than a minute. Um, if we could all stand up. So Sorry. All right, just checking that we can still hear me. Yes. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to stretch our bodies to the left. Let's do that. And we stretch to the left because that is where our politics are rooted. Because we are feminist activists here. Okay. And next we're going to stretch to the other left. Because again, we are rooted in the left. <laughs> and we don't want to mention what is not left. <laughs> All right, and next we want to stretch and touch the ground uh, because that is where we reconnect with our roots and our ancestors. And then next we stretch and we reach the sky because that is where our feminist visions are. All right, and now uh, feel free to Take a moment, stand up, get a drink, and we will be back in at just five past the hour. So in about three minutes, I will just play some music. So a hint, if the music stops, come back in. Thanks, everyone. Okay, I think we're all back. So Bandana, yeah. take it away and continue with the panels. That was lovely. Thank you, Marianne. I hope everybody liked that little break. Uh, the stretch was wonderful. And uh, so we go back to our panel now uh, with the second round of questions. Uh, there have been some questions on the Q&A box and there are many comments. Uh, so I'm glad that everybody is engaging. So, mm, well, with the whole uh, session, so now our second question uh, is uh, again the same question for uh, everybody, all the panelists. Now, how does an intersectional feminist lens help us understand the current realities of labor migration in general and of migrant women workers in particular? And you could take a specific angle or a context either from the country perspective or regional context or like Nicola did, the governance, um, global governance lens. So um, uh, a lot of these points have already started these uh, discussions. So I would again take the same um, sequence and I, this time each of the panelists get about five minutes so that we can have some time for uh, 
little bit of discussion. So can we start with you, Tanya? Yes. Yes, yes, yes thank, thank you. you. So um, what I'd, I'd like to talk about is, um, is a more specific example. So I mentioned that I've been doing, uh, I've done work on Bolivian migration to Argentina. And I think to illustrate how intersectionality works, I would go um, to one of the specific sectors where many Bolivians work in Argentina, which is the garment sector. So many Bolivians are employed in garment workshop. Most of them are, um, are in the informal economy, so they're obviously linked to some part of the formal economy, but the actual most of the work that's that's done in the garment workshops is is informal, and um, many workers are uh, undocumented. Um, and 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 explain how the the exploit so how how through the work in the garment workshops the. Um, it, there is a creation of hierarchies within the Bolivian communities and then how that translates into how women might or might not have access to different types of organizations at, at the destinations so in Argentina. So, um, so many, uh, so the garment workshops that many Bolivians work in were bought. So it used to be as a sector dominated by Korean migrants. And then over time, Bolivians were brought in as workers. They worked their way up. They started buying um, the workshops uh, of the Korean migrants some 20, 30 years ago. And then as, as time went on, so the, the Bolivians would use their social networks and bring in new migrants who were not as aware of labor um, legislation in Argentina were not aware that they were not really they're not really going to be deported. And so the garment workshops owners would use that fear of um, being deported uh, and to, to basically keep the workers in the in the workshops. And um, you know, as previous speakers uh, mentioned, they would um, you know suffer a lot of uh, exploitation as in some of the other sectors. So they would work 16 hours a day for very little pay, have very little time off. Um, and over time through the Bolivian community, you can, you can see how over the decades there was um, an, an elite established based from the benefits that they would accrue by owning um, government workshops. So they, and, and sometimes it's a very difficult um, thing to approach because sometimes it's, it's understood or it's presented as a cultural problem that Bolivians are kind of allow themselves to be exploited or that they're used to working such uh, unreasonable hours or they're willing to do it. But it's really a, 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 a question that these, um, but it's really the case that this happens because the current modes of capitalist production are able to feed off migration practices that have been going on for a long time. So it's so we can see that there is a, an, a, a specific specific sector in the economy that is um, dominated by a particular nationality, and then this creates a particular hierarchy within that community in in Argentina. And um, so most of my work has been ethnographic, so it was very community based and. What I was surprised about was that I wasn't really seeing a lot of engagement in organizations. So this was for my doctoral, my PhD work. So then in, in later work, I, I, I went through different types of organizations and I was really interested to trying to understand how migrants organize. Um, and so I don't really have a lot of time to go into, into many details, but it, it, it turned out that some of the nationality-based organizations were, were very much um, were kind of benefiting from this hierarchy that I've, I've mentioned that was created in a, in a specific sector. Um, and, and it was really interesting how they had a very different um, approach to migrants and migrants' rights and um, migrants' rights and um, and in other words other organizations which are very much based in the informal settlements where many migrants live that um, that had a very strong uh, discourse um, 
uh, protected migrants' rights. So um, the the nationality-based organizations were very much detached from what we could see from the realities. I'll end with Hannah. From the realities of um, of where most of the migrants lived, and when it came to, uh, for example, examples of cases of domestic violence, when women went to uh, Bolivian or Peruvian organizations, so the ones that were nationality-based, there there were often, from what I've seen, the, the examples that I've, I've come across, they were uh, shut down and they were, it was, there was an attempt of dealing with that problem within the organizations instead of using the, the normal recourse, which would be, you know, go to the police and, and denounce your, your husband. Um, so, and this wasn't necessarily the case, in fact, it wasn't the case in the, in the grassroots organizations where uh, you had different nationalities that participated in those um, in those organizations, and it was they had a very um, a, a much stronger class based um, they made much stronger class based class based demands that cut across nationality. So sorry, I think five minutes is very short for um, for explaining what's quite a complex um, reality, but I, I hope it gave you some idea of how nationality, class, and gender intersect in that context. So I'll pass back on to you, Vandana. You're right, Shaitanya. Five minutes is much too short to be able to understand a particular context and able to engage with this. Um, we could have an entire day discussing the various, you know, just this one question or even more than a day. So I hope we get an opportunity to discuss these things further in other contexts. So we move on to uh, move back to Mary. Thank you very much. Well, now let me just share my screen again. I have my last um, picture. Okay. So um, can you please see my screen? Okay. Yeah, so before I come into the com um, the complexities of what COVID has done to women in some sectors, in the informal sector, let me also address that um, when it comes to Ghana, women are mainly in the informal sector doing domestic work, head portrait, which I explained earlier, and also some of them um, cross-border trading. So some of the women cross um, Ghana border to the neighboring countries to buy foodstuffs. And in terms of international migration, they also go to the Gulf um, countries to do domestic work. Um, governments, um, in terms of legislation, the, um, the only when you look at the Ghana, the LI, the legislative instrument, the only work that can work 48 hours is domestic work, internal domestic workers. They are allowed to work 48 hours without break. And this is something that we've been struggling with. And we are hoping that um, we have a draft labor migration policy. Some of these policies can be reviewed. Again, the government recently banned the, the visa 2020 that allows women to go to the Gulf states to work. In terms of the head portrait, the, the, which I call the Kaya, they, they, their activities are not regulated by um, the government, any legislative instruments. And so, they had all these things expose them to some exploitative work. Okay, so now in the midst of these confused um, legislative instruments, here comes COVID um, to muddy the waters for a lot of migrant women. And so you see the, the pictures, these are studies, we recently did a study in one of my projects. We're looking at the new conflict that has been introduced as a result of um, COVID-19. And so these are women in the first, the women in the track. These are stranded um, headquarters after the two weeks lockdown. The two weeks lockdown was, came as an emergency. Um, and because Talking about the complexities, talking about the, the intersectionalities, the things that the various attributes, because these are things that government has not um, has not been taking keen look at. They just announced, I mean, th there was just a lockdown for two weeks, three days to it. And so these rural urban migrants or people, these migrants who had moved from the northern side to the south, mainly to look for work, were stranded. 
And so how do they get back home? Because their sleeping place, they have to pay. They have to pay to use the toilet. They have to pay to use water. They have to pay. And even the, the social distancing where all issues, issues they are sleeping, sleeping in crowded places. places. And the shoppers who give the money were locked down. And so nobody was coming to the market to to sell anything or to buy anything. And so for their survival, they needed to go back home. Unfortunately, it was 5 p.m., so they were locked in Accra. And so this is somebody, a cargo person, because goods and services could move. And so they were mixed up in the goods and the goods that were being sent to the northern part by this cargo person. And they were buried in the cargo. So it was the police that arrested them, the security arrested them. I mean, they arrested the driver and they realized that there were human beings beneath the goods with their kids. And the surprising thing was no social distance and no mask. And this is how the scene was. It was actually the police that unveiled the car so that there could be fresh air. Why am I doing, why am I saying this? And so the, the responses, although the governments, governments were proactive, so Ghana government was proactive, talk, thinking about those in the informal sector was something that was not considered. And so these women were left stranded with their children. How do they take care of them? How do they survive? Again, when you come back to the other side on the one on the, the women, this is a night market at 12 a.m. And 12 a.m. who will believe that in the midst of COVID there will be a market. That is because the government had closed down the markets. And so these women thinking about how to survive, a lot of men, when talking to these women, their men had lost their jobs. And so they were home with their men. How do they survive? I mean, when they, uh, some of the stories, they say, when we leave home, we will die. When we go back to the market, we will die anyway. So it's better we die of COVID than to be, die, be dying of hunger. And so they found themselves 12 a.m. in the market area doing business. And there were people also to buy. And so these are some of the activities um, that um, alluded these women. One, they are women. The fact that they needed to take care of their houses. Most of these women are also single um, household heads, and so needed to take care of their. Although schools were closed, they were not sure when schools would be open in any way for them to go back to school and have to pay fees. And so they had to struggle between taking care of family, taking care of their themselves, and the, in the midst of COVID. And how were these, especially when it came to the, the headquarters, if they decided to live in Accra, they had to pay for everything. I mean, the toilets, the space, the water, everything is paid for on a daily basis. And so in order, in a situation where they had no, um, no money to survive, no uh, uh, any support or social support system, they had to then go back home where at least their families would be there, they would have a place to lay their heads, and then lo and behold, they were caught and they were. So, I mean, the agency of the migrants is also important. So out of this frustration and out of this arrest, the government started providing um, hot meals daily for these women and some other more rural urban, rural urban migrants who were found in Accra and also other capital cities where the lockdown was also implemented. They were provided with free water. They were provided with, I mean, some basic amenities to help them. And again, government also, as a result of these, also increased the support that it gives to these kinds of people in these fields. And so I, I do acknowledge that yes, there was COVID, government didn't think about it, but the activities of these women moving beyond, trying to exercise their agency, trying to exercise their rights, trying to maneuver through the structures in order to make their family survive. At least that also brought um, some innovations, some, some, um, some um, ways of solutions to their problems about um, the problems that they were encountering. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I think the reality that you described will resonate with many colleagues in many countries. This is exactly what happened. And uh, as uh, one of the panelists pointed out, the, you know, the agency comes with so much of constraint and just fighting all the time. So we move on uh, now to Priya. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so I only have five minutes, so I'm going to have to race through the points um, that I'm trying to get across. So as I mentioned, um, what I saw and many others have, of course, uh, written about is that gender, class, caste identities um, carry over in from rural areas into the modern sector, into urban work, into industrialized work, and other dimensions of modern living away from rural areas. And what we see in the case of um, work in industry and in urban areas is that powerful castes who were rural patrons are now controlling a lot of the modern businesses um, that employ migrant workers. And they seek to reproduce hierarchies that give them an advantage and help them to maintain control through um, caste relations over these uh, migrant workers who um, labor migrants often belong to the lower caste. So this can explain why certain groups of people are positioned in certain kinds of work and how they're controlled through caste and of course gender hierarchies and relations as well that are deeply entrenched in Indian society. And certain kinds of work are quite feminized, uh, which are typically low skilled, although, um, as Nicola said, that term is highly problematic. And, um, and I recognize that, but for, for lack of a better alternative right now, I'm using that. Um, so they're typically in low skilled, informal, work and this kind of work is performed largely by women but men can also be in work of this kind and um, and if you take the example of the garment industry for example women are often employed in the lowest jobs such as thread cutting which means uh, trimming off threads after a garment has been stitched whereas the floor managers are often men or the tailors because uh, women are perceived as less capable of complex and skilled tasks. And control over these female workers on the shop floor is exercised through patriarchal um, norms and relations and also intersecting with caste um, identities and relations. So if, if the workers belong to a lower caste and happen to be women and are being controlled by a man belonging to an upper caste, then those kinds of dynamics come into play. And this is how, in fact, a lot of workers are controlled. Women are routinely paid less, which other people have also observed today, um, uh, than men for comparable work. So even if they are doing skilled work or, or complex tasks or equally back-breaking work, they are paid less. So for example, in construction, women may carry very heavy loads of bricks and stone and sand. Uh, and men might be bricklayers, but um, you know they're, they're paid much less and their prospects for upward mobility are highly limited. It's very difficult for skilled work to be accessed by women in the informal sector. So especially with work that doesn't require formal qualifications, men are still able to move up through you know, acquiring skills informally on the job, whereas for women, that becomes more difficult. Now, these kinds of jobs um, where certain groups of society, so low caste and women, are kept in a kind of subjugated position are an integral part of the capital accumulation strategy of national and global enterprises. So, I mean, a lot of garment um, units are linked up with uh, the export industry. Um, the construction firms, not necessarily so, but nevertheless, you know, keeping certain people in certain positions and not remunerating them properly is a part of their kind of strategy to accumulate capital. Um, migrant workers are being employed in ever more fragmented ways as well that keep them beyond the purview of the law. Uh, unionization is discouraged. Um, um, it may even be formally not permitted, like in you know, special um, economic zones that are geared to export. And uh, therefore, it's very difficult for workers to collectively demand any kind of change or improvement in their working conditions or honoring of their rights. 
But the picture is very complicated, as I said earlier, and very briefly, I just want to mention again that these jobs can be very important for people coming from rural areas where they come from a highly unequal situation in the first place. So these jobs do provide them with an opportunity for transgressing social boundaries of caste and gender. Um, and therefore, they need to be viewed in that way. You know, they are exploitative, but they may be providing them with some opportunities as well. And precisely what that mix is, or the degree to which they can exercise agency in such a constrained situation, um, depends on a number of uh, rather unpredictable factors. So that is something that needs to be borne in mind. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. I know I'm being very unfair to people with just giving very little time and each of these issues, but as uh, you know, we said that there are uh, five other sessions and many of these issues that are being raised today will be taken up in different sector sessions. Organizing, for example, and uh, agency, and we will be hearing from migrant workers, we'll be hearing from migrant worker leaders, so bear with us for this very unfair um, constraint uh, on the panelists. Uh, so now we go to um, you, Nicola, for the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my one key point in my five minutes follows on really nicely from what Priya has already said. And again, I'm coming at this from global governing framework, which um, does, of course, reflect um, national preferences by many, many states and governments. Um, and, and, this and this relates to um, what I just sort of um, simplistically call here the labor gap. So basically what, you know, uh, observing these um, global policy processes and debates, what broadly emerged, has emerged as a trend is um, much more emphasis having been placed on, if you like, the governance of migration, so border control, um, the securitization um, aspect, rather than placing more emphasis on, uh, if you like, labor governance, i.e. what goes on in the workplace, employment conditions, hiring practices, and so forth. Um, and this is reflected in um, the resistance by many governments to instituting so-called firewalls, you know, providing migrants with, you know, more um, straightforward access to justice and spending more money on labor inspectorates rather than border control mechanisms. And we see here a massive gap. Uh, in other words, stopping to criminalize migrant workers, uh, you know, particularly the un undocumented and putting the spotlight more on employers. And what this means for women, uh, for women migrants, is this uh, more securitized approach, if you like, has um, really placed the focus, when we talk about migrant women's rights, it, the focus often is more on trafficking. And broadly speaking, this trafficking uh, discourse has failed to relate violence against women from the point of view of state sanctioned labor exploitation. And as a result, we see relatively little headway being made to advance women's labor and uh, social rights. And this state of affairs has of course been acutely exposed by the COVID pandemic as Mary has uh, nicely um, um, talked about earlier. And in the, in the area of the um, sort of more development related um, debates, uh, you know, the development and migration nexus what this has meant here is um, we have, you know, heard uh, much more talk here about migrants being agents of development and given the feminization of migration, of course, women are also here very much celebrated as agents of development. And I suppose as, as feminists, of course, we, we like the celebration of women's um, agencies as, as opposed to the victim approach. However, and, and this is sort of where... Um, this uh, follows on what Priya has said in the context of economic neoliberal globalization, this, this type of agency takes on a very different meaning. It means placing the burden of development on the shoulders of individuals, individual migrant women, at, if you like, at the triple feminization of work, poverty, and migration. And it really um, shifts away the um, lens from um, state responsibility. Um, and so really, uh, you know, from the point of view of migrant women, the priority is um, obtaining paid work and staying in it, so wage and income security, um, and this in, in relation to broadening the channels to legal migration, quantitatively but also qualitatively, better decent work, greater greater freedom of movement within labour markets, you know, between employers and sectors, 
but also ultimately the right not to have to migrate in the first place. You know, back to the slogan, migration should be a choice, not a necessity in terms of better, decent work at home, safety, uh, you know, social safety nets, education, skill development. And from the experience of Asia, we do know regular migration status alone is not a solution against labor rights violations and, and lacking access to services. So in other words, key really is addressing these the temporality precarity nexus, if you like, um, to me to address the, the labor gap in you know global discourse and the policies that have come out of it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Couldn't agree more with you. Absolutely brilliant. So um, I am not even trying to summarize and take time. I think each of our panelists spoke very succinctly, very clearly, and made very precise points. So now we open the floor for questions and answers. Any comments? Marianne, can you take over? Yeah, sure. So we yeah. have. Uh, we've had quite a number of questions come in through the chat, through the Q&A, and through uh, our Facebook uh, live post as well. So I'm going to share some questions. We can, I think, uh, I'll share a few questions, and then we can come back to uh, the rest of the questions. We don't want to read them all out now. So I'll read out four questions, and I can have uh, one panelist uh, answer each question. Um, okay, so... The first question we got is, um, that I have here is, how do you think we can properly, properly include the intersectionality between uh, migration and disability? Um, and I don't know that any uh, speaker specifically uh, addressed this, uh, so I'm keeping it open, but maybe, uh, Tanya, are you open to answering this question? If you are, I can, I can pass that to you. Hi, Marianne, yeah, your, your mic has gone very quiet is so is this the first question about migration and disability yes uh, yeah i've I've, uh, I've tried to answer that question in in the q a um so i mean I, i'm not quite sure whether the question is about in practice or in research but i, I think so um I, I think in terms of research and understanding how disability intersects with migration and the experience of uh, people who carry disabilities in, in, in migration. I think intersectionality is, I mean, one of the benefits, but also one of the problems of, of the framework is that it's it's very flexible, that you can, you can include many types of inequalities and uh, access of inequalities within, uh, within, within the framework. So that, that's one of its benefits. It's also one of its pitfalls because it, 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 there is a limit to how much stuff you can include before it, it just comes down to a single experience of a single person. So you, you want to be able to, to link um, the variables, if you like, the inequalities that you bring within an intersectional perspective to, um, to, to, to more macro structures of, of inequalities. Um, so I think from kind of um, a, a framework point of view in terms of what intersectionality is and, and what it allows you to do, I think you, you can include disability within, within the framework and that will give you um, a, an understanding of the experiences that people who carry disabilities have within, my, within migration. I'm not quite sure whether, whether that would be helpful in practice. I think in, in practice it, it could be but other panelists are probably better place to talk about that than I am. Am I still being, is my audio still on very low? I don't know if people can hear me. It's, it's really, really quiet, yeah. It's barely audible, can't really hear you. I will try this without uh, earphones, is this better? Yeah, yeah, much better. Okay, thank you. Um, I will try to keep my voice up so you can all hear me the whole time. Um, I will read out two questions for uh, Priya and one question for Nicola. And then in that, uh, after you both answer them, I'll come back to another set of questions for uh, Mary as well. So uh, one of the questions we have here is uh, for Priya. Um, I have observed that reasons for women's migration is often clubbed into water type categories like marriage or employment. However, I find that these do not involve a clear-cut process. Can you share your views on this? 
Um, and another question that I think is uh, that you touched on earlier was how do how does caste carry across borders? Um, we haven't seen enough research on that. Uh, looking at the South Asia Gulf corridor, um, and I'll read the question for Nicola, um, which is intersectional feminist uh, and labor of labor migration depends on a complex relation among racial identity, gender, nationality, social, political paradigms of labor migration in general, and women's labor migration in particular. Um, can you share some thoughts on this? Um, but I'm also going to add another question, question for Nicola, which uh, is a little bit different, but I think can be addressed uh, together, which is um, what are you doing, or I suppose what are people doing to address um, institutional violence and human rights of women sex workers uh, given that they are also migrant and informal workers and not necessarily uh, trafficked. And I wanted to address this to you, Nicola, because you mentioned earlier uh, that kind of uh, you know analysis where my, when migrant informal workers or informal workers are clogged sometimes under uh, trafficked women. So maybe we can uh, answer those two together and I'll uh, give you the floor for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll respond to the first question on um, the reasons for women's migration in India. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, in um, you know, in sort of analysis based on national statistics, uh, the predominant reason for women's migration is. Uh, marriage. So, uh, and and that is the only reason that is mainly considered um, when people comment on women's migration. In in recent years, there has been a little bit more acknowledgement that people, you know, women may start working after they migrate. So there is a reason to consider other things that happen to them after migration, even if they do migrate because or, or they change residences basically because they got married. But I think it, I feel that the analysis is still very unsatisfactory because the reasons for migration are so very complicated and there's very little discussion on what their own aspirations are in the process. You know, how do they figure into it? And, and one of the reasons is this kind of victimization of female migrants, you know, the analysis that they're either migrating because they're following, you know, they're going to another house to, um, because they got married or they're being pushed out uh, or for whatever reason, but they're never seen as agents who are trying to do something about their lives. And, uh, and it, it may be because they themselves don't clearly state that, you know, they are expected because of social expectations, because of their, you know, cultural expectations around their behavior and their role within the family to state um, how they're migrating to fulfill fine family uh, goals and aims, like earning more money for the family or sending it back for their relatives. But within that can be wrapped their own personal aspirations as well, because you know they can gain a degree of independence through migration, but, but of course it's very constrained as we discussed earlier. And the second question was related to caste um, in migration across borders. I don't, you're right, there's not a lot of discussion on that. I mean, um, there could be something from the Center for Development Studies in Kerala that's looked at migration to the Gulf in great detail, you know, different dimensions of that. And um, I know that they've done some work on cost as well, but I, I personally haven't uh, read that. And I don't know uh, to what extent we understand that. We do have some understanding of the kind of um, class background that people come from, I mean, related to the sort of wealth, because it's not a cheap proposition from migrating abroad. So mostly it is the slightly better off people who are able to do that, even if they do that through advanced payments or whatever. So, um, I mean, um, I don't, uh, I haven't sort of seen if there are any sort of debt migrants where all the costs are paid up front that can enable very uh, low cost and poor people to migrate abroad uh, in the way that you see in other countries, you know, where um, intermediaries will pay the costs up front and that enables poor people to migrate. So I don't think that the same applies to lower caste people necessarily, but I don't know. I think it's something that I would like to look at in greater detail. Thank you. 
Nicola, over to you. Yes, thank you, Priya. Yes, thank you for those um, two really good questions. Um, in terms of my thoughts on the complexity of labor migration from a, uh, if I remember correctly, sort of racialized um, hierarchy perspective, you know, different migrant women existing in the same kind of similar space in terms of labor markets. Um, it's, it's a very good question. And um, I guess I, again, would come at it from the point of view of um, political advocacy, um, where we also see uh, in many places, if we take just now the example, for example, uh, of domestic work um, and, and what, what I've observed, observed in Asia, Asia you know, I have lived in Singapore, but also uh, spent time in Hong Kong, um, where we do have different um, nationality groups uh, in this well, labor market, domestic work, so to speak, and a clear hierarchy in terms of payment levels, um, skill levels, you know, the way in which recruitment agencies sell Filipinas different to Indonesians, different to Sri Lankans. And sometimes, you know, at the very bottom, like Indian domestic workers, they might have been displaced meanwhile by Cambodian domestic workers, I don't know. And the countries of origin, um, governments also clearly um, undercutting uh, because, you know, the market is tight, you know, trying to accept, a, you know, lower uh, minimum wages and so forth. So here clearly a rule and divide strategy, and that also makes political organizing difficult as, you know, great distrust among these different uh, groups of my, uh, migrant workers. However, we have one positive example here, and I know I'm acutely aware um, uh, there are um, uh, representatives from organizations in the room who would know much better or have an update here. Um, and this is Hong Kong, uh, where different domestic workers have, from different countries have not only formed their own organizations, like the Indonesian Domestic Work Organization versus Philippines, they have also formed an umbrella organization and actually uh, work together and work together in collaboration with the Hong Kong uh, Confederation of Free Trade Unions. Um, and actually, in, in that sense, uh, you know, we're, we're able to form a united front, so to speak. So here is a positive example. Um, in terms of uh, institutional violence and human rights of sex workers and how to address that, uh, again, um, I'm sure this will also be a an, an topic to be discussed, uh, one of the sessions which is going to be run by um, advocates, and there are enough uh, um, present here in this particular session. But from the um, global governance level, what I could say here is um, this issue actually did come up and was discussed, and there were civil society organizations present who did fight for um, sex workers, human, uh, sex workers, human, human and labor rights at the ILO Congress when ILO Convention 190 was negotiated and discussed. Um, so here, um, you know, sex workers' rights did feed into that debate. Um, it is, of course, highly controversial in, 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 in many countries, uh, and even, I have to say, among feminists. I mean, I'm um, personally, uh, you know, totally um, convinced, you know, we need labor rights for sex workers. And unfortunately, there is, you know, rising um, advocacy happening. But there are many more in the room who would know about this so much better. So I'll leave it here. Not very satisfactory answer. Apologies. Thank you, Nicola. Um, and I think the, there's a question for um, Mary as well that's coming through the uh, Q&A that I think she's either working to answer or has already answered. Um, let me just read that out loud. Um, yes, so I think she's already answered it, but I wonder if we could um, hear a bit more about um, the... So, okay, yes, there we go. So um, from the story of uh, Mary regarding the, the women quarters who have not been recognized, um, is there any organization together with women to fight for their rights? Um, and I think there was another question that came in from Mary uh, specifically that was in the chat, but I'm not finding it at the moment. Uh, but Mary, maybe you can address that. I have tried to answer most of my questions, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe okay. just to, oh, I can skip it because I've tried to answer as much as I could. Sure. And uh, we got another question that I think has not been answered. Um, okay. We'll check that out as well. So this one came from um, a person asking about uh, what, let's see if this has been answered yet, because there are men coming in. Okay, so I think we can direct this one to you. So um, there's a question related to the pandemic and crisis faced by migrants. 
and how to uh, expose the issues around citizenship of migrants, and how do you link this to the to this issue to a feminist lens? And I think you started talking to us a bit about that, Mary, about the impact of uh, COVID on, on on migrant workers. So maybe you can share a little bit more about that. Okay, I didn't quite get the beginning of the question. Can you can you kindly repeat it? And if I can, sure. So um, the pandemic and the crisis faced by migrants, this question was uh, talking about, especially in India, but I think, you know, we know that the effects of the pandemic have been global. Um, the, the pandemic has exposed issues around the citizenship of migrants. So I imagine citizenship rights and access to that. And so how do you link this issue to a feminist lens? Um, and maybe yeah, just talk a little bit about it from the context uh, that you were telling us about in Ghana. Okay, so maybe for, for the citizenship issues, maybe let me um, talk about the um, Ghanaian domestic workers who go to the Gulf um, regions. And so um, during the pandemic, several of these domestic migrants were brought back to Ghana. So the government supported with the evacuation of some of them. And sometimes uh, those who came a bit early, I mean, during the early parts of the COVID, the government paid for the their hotel bills for the quarantine, for the testing. And so when they, looking at it from the intersectional point, wherever they were as my, as um, domestic migrants, you should remember that in these the, um, Gulf, some of these Gulf countries, one, as soon as they get there, their passports are taken from them. And so one, once your passport is taken from you, your, you don't have any documentation, even if you have, you want to, escape some of the abuses that you go through or even um, want to return from the place is difficult. So the fact that you are migrants and your status is also dependent on the employee and the, on the employer, it means that you are one, your work as a domestic migrant, the context of being um, in one of the Gulf um, countries where women rights are still being contested. And the fact that you are still a migrant doing domestic work, perhaps you are even not educated because most of these uh, migrants are not, those who go to the Gulf countries, our studies have shown that they are not highly educated. And they go there to do so many other jobs. Sometimes they are abused. And so these kinds of um, different um, attributes give them different experiences that contribute to multiple um, discrimination in the host country. And maybe when you come to Ghana, so we have domestic workers who travel from West African countries to the country. Again, here, yes, we talk about ECOWAS um, free movement. And I was answering in the chat that the pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities in some of these um, protocols. Once there was COVID, countries didn't think about the free protocol, free movement protocol. What they started doing was to look to close their borders. And up to now, a lot of land borders are closed. So how do these women in the informal sector survive, especially those whose lives are dependent on exporting from these different countries um, in the neighboring um, areas? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, we have another question. Uh, I think I will direct this one to Priya since uh, it's talking about the context in Mumbai. So the question reads, in the second wave of COVID, we have found a very interesting trend in cities like Mumbai, uh, where women, especially those working in the sanitation and waste management sector, are leaving their children behind in villages and coming back to work in cities. They're working every single day because this work falls under essential work and they have to keep their family income going. Are we seeing such trends around the world, but also maybe uh, talking about this trend particularly, if, if you have uh, any more information about it or if you have any, uh, you know, thing, anything else to tell us about it. I can't comment on um, uh, this trend. Um, you know, in the context of COVID in other parts of the world. But what I will say is that in a highly uncertain context, you know, where migrants expect there to be a lot of hardship and risk, it is quite common for them to leave their children behind. And we have been seeing this uh, for a long time now. So I wouldn't say that this is 
a new pattern necessarily. Maybe, um, I mean, it's not new in the sense that when migrants first go away somewhere, they leave their children behind. And then if they are able to establish a stable way of living and earning, they might consider bringing their children over. And I've seen this in many other countries that I've worked in as well, so like South Africa, for example. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what the situation is with COVID in other parts of the world. And even in India, you know, with regards to women leaving their children behind. So it's quite interesting, but it kind of corroborates um, earlier patterns, as I say. Thanks. Over to the next one now. Thank you, Priya. Um, there was another question that came up that I wanted to address. So uh, this one is particularly on uh, intersectionality as a framework and how it can be strengthened. Um, it is a bit broad, but uh, I know uh, Tanya spoke to us a little bit in the beginning about uh, how uh, intersectionality has kind of a, a longer history beyond its, its beyond the, the framing that we know now, even beyond the, the root of the term itself. So maybe you can speak to us a little bit about uh, intersectionality and some of the critiques around it to, to address this question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think it's one of the beauties of, of the framework and, and one of the weaknesses is, is that it, it's, I see intersectionality more as an intention. So the framework itself, I don't think it's a theory. It doesn't really have a methodology. So it doesn't really tell us how to do things. And, and uh, which is in, in a way, it's, it, it's why it's become so popular, I think, because people who've got different types of, um, who've got different disciplines or uh, who have a preference for different methodologies can still use intersectionality and adapt it to what they, they work, usually work with. Um, but then it can also be disconcerting if somebody wants to use intersectionality, but it doesn't really tell you what to do with it, how to apply it. So it's it's a benefit, but it's also a weakness. And and similarly, as I mentioned before, I think one of the uh, it's it, it it one of um, uh, so it, 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 you can add many dimensions of disadvantage to to your study. Um, but I think it, it then becomes diluted. And I've I seen one of the questions was about victims of trafficking, for example, if trafficking, being a victim of trafficking is and could be seen as an axis of um, intersectionality. And I, I think like being a victim of trafficking, it, I think it's more related to a legal framework and accessing support uh, for people who have been trafficked. But in a way, it might be more useful to think of, you know, what are the, the, the social categories that, that allows you to understand why somebody becomes a victim of trafficking? So it, it, it's, it's because, you know, labor markets are, are gendered because they don't find jobs in their places of origin and because of, of the way in which migration is structured. Um, that you know that that's all gendered and, and racialized, which then means that some people um, have access uh, to migration only through means that then would lead them to a situation in which they're trafficked. So I, I wouldn't say that that trafficking or being a victim of trafficking is is useful as a category that we can use in intersectionality, but it. Think about more about you know what are the broader categories in relation to race, class, uh, you know, depending on what the context is, that that helps you understand why somebody becomes a victim of trafficking, and and then work with those in order to to redress them. Um, yeah, I leave a bit of time. I've got more to say, but I leave a bit of time for others as well. Thank you, Tanya. Yes, I think. Time is definitely a constraint, so we might we'll have to close the Q and A session here. But I really appreciate uh, also that the panelists were uh, engaging in the, in the in the chat as well as in the Q and A portion. Um, and of course, you know, thank you to the panelists, thank you, Bandana. Before, of course, we leave everyone, and we really appreciate your engagement through uh, questions and answers. Uh, we want to share a really quick uh, poll um, just to get a sense of how we're all feeling after the session. I know it's been 
a lot of information uh, to absorb, but a lot of very rich and uh, interesting discussion for sure. I can say that. Um, so I will launch the poll, and if you have uh, any issues accessing it, maybe also reach out to uh, tech support. Um, but it would be really helpful for us if you could just quickly answer this, and um, then I'll hand it over to Vandana to form the closed session. So don't leave us just yet. Okay, I hope we are seeing the poll now. I have launched the polling. And I also want to mention an apology that our poll is only in English and Spanish for now. So for those who are not able to access it, we apologize, we'll improve for the next ones. Okay, I see the poll has been active for about a minute. I'm going to give that another 30 seconds, I would say, before I hand over to Bandana to wrap up. Or perhaps, Bandana, I think I can invite you to wrap up because I, think, I see that we only have about 57, 58% in and I want to get more people in. So maybe you can wrap up and I'll close the poll. All right. Okay. So um, before I um, formally close and say thank you to everybody, um, I would also like to remind all of you that this is just the first session. There are five more sessions to go. Uh, can we show the slide? Yeah. Uh, so. So we have today we finished the first one and then we are meeting next on 14th May and that's on feminist knowledge building and research on labor migration. And this would be the community-based feminist participatory action researches that the NGOs have done uh, with migrant workers. So APWLE will be speaking, FLEX will be speaking, some colleagues from Latin America will speak, and some colleagues from Africa will also speak. So don't miss this one. And the third one, we will be on 4th June. And do keep in mind that that will be about representation and um, uh, writing about uh, labor migration. And the next slide, please. So, and then we are again three weeks later on 25th June is absolutely important session on how does a feminist lens inform, how has it informed our advocacy and how do we take it further. And uh, then the fifth one is on labor migration and intersectional feminist organizing how the migrant workers, particularly the low wage women migrant workers have been able to organize. We got several examples uh, today itself and we will deepen that uh, next. And um, then the last one of course would be the finale, envisioning a feminist, the feminist futures in labor migration. So uh, do join us again and I would, uh, we look forward to all of you Thank you very much. I'd like, like to thank our panelists very deeply, and we will stay in touch with you. Those are wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, presentations and discussions. I wish we had more time. And we would like to thank all our um, uh, audience today, those who made time for this. Uh, and um, do come back again. And um, the entire co-organizing team, which is teamwork, we are learning, this is a new way of doing things. And um, so 
And this has been a wonderful experience working together on this one. You saw the faces of only a few people on screen. There are a lot of people whose faces you did not see. And without their hard work, these sessions could not have gone on. So thank you very much. And we'll see you have a good weekend. And we see each other again on 14th May. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>